Hi, welcome to the Live with Hindustan Times. If you are active on social media or you follow international news, once in a while you may have seen pictures and videos such as these that you can see on your screen right now being circulated since morning. Videos of people froth frothing at the mouth, writhing with pain, choking, gasping for air. So according to reports on Tuesday, northern Syria was attacked with a strong toxic chemical or nerve agent. The number of uh, casualties right now are not confirmed, but reports suggest that close to 100 people have died so far after being exposed to this gas. Survivors, whoever, according to some reports, survivors say that they saw uh, the shells of these, this gas being dropped from, from war, war planes. Uh, I'm Anira Chaudhary and along with me is uh, Reza, Reza Ul Laskar of HT World. Uh, Reza, what do we know about this attack so far? Well, you know, it's uh, pretty clear that there was an attack with some sort of chemical. Uh, we have pretty graphic, pretty dramatic footage coming in from Idlib in Syria. Uh, there are clearly very disturbing images of children. At least 20 children have reportedly died, according to a Syrian uh, rights group. Uh, people are saying that uh, the latest figures that we are getting is about 72 dead, and uh, this includes as 20 children. And clearly, you know, the images show some sort of chemical agent has been used. Uh, people frothing, people having difficulty in breathing, uh, pretty gruesome images, in fact. Of, uh, and then, you know, just after the attack uh, with the chemical, there was an attack on the hospital where the people, the survivors were being treated. So it's, a, I mean, Syria is not a place, you know, where we haven't had chemical attacks in the past. There have been several other instances. was the chemical agent used this time. Right. So that is the unknown quantity. And you know, given the complexity of the situation in Syria, already there's blame game going on. Um, the Russians are saying that you know it wasn't uh, the government forces. Uh, in fact, when the Russian government planes bombed uh, what Russia says was a militant hideout, mm -hmm. and they say that the militants there were building some sort of chemical weapons, and that got accidentally released. But on the other side, we have a different narrative from the U.S. and from the Western countries. They are clearly blaming uh, the government forces, the forces of uh, President Bashar al-Assad for this incident. Yeah. So it's a pretty confusing picture, but what we do know is that there was some sort of a chemical agent involved mm. and pretty gruesome, pretty bad you know, situation over there, a lot of casualties. Yeah. In fact, as you say, there are two separate camps. Russia is blaming it on someone else and leaders from Britain, US and EU. In fact, Donald Trump went a step ahead and said he also blamed it on the Obama government weak policies. So that's a little strange. But uh, as you rightly pointed out about the hospital, so there's a video which I've been doing the round, especially in the international me uh, media, about a, uh, of a doctor who has filmed himself treating the patients and treating the ones attacked. Uh, through his own phone and he's saying clearly that this is not a chlorine bomb and he's saying it, uh, he's emphasizing that this is something, uh, a new kind of a gas, it's a nerve agent which is causing the kind of effects that have never been seen before. And I think it's important to point out here that uh, uh, the sarin gas was used, uh, I think it's a confirmed report in Damascus on August 21, 2013. And yeah, oh, at I mean, that time, over 1,000 yeah, people died? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a history, as I said. You know, there's a history, and, you know, Syria is a pretty complicated picture. There have been instances of uh, chemical attacks in 2013, 2014, and 2015. And as you pointed out, 2013, people talk about a sarin, sarin attack, about 1,400 people died. Right. And, you know, there was an agreement after that attack between U.S. and Russia to destroy all of uh, Syria's chemical weapons stocks. Hmm. Clearly that hasn't happened. Yet. Right, right. So if we talk about agreement, let's also uh, talk a little about the Geneva Protocol, the one which came into effect sometime in 1928, yeah. which sort of said, you know, prohibits use of all chemical and bio biological warfare because of the kind of, uh, you know, ca the number of casualties that it causes. It's actually a humanitarian crisis if you look at it that way. Well, you know, I mean, again, you have to go back into history. The first known instances of widespread use of chemical weapons was during World War One, and World War One was one where you know people actually for the first time saw the kind of destruction that uh, and the devastation that can be caused by chemical weapons. Yeah. There were instances of thousands of soldiers being affected, thousands of soldiers dying, and people having long-term effects of these chemical agents. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason why you know the world powers acted to ban mm -hmm. to outlaw these uh, chemical agents. Now, I mean, you know, Syria, the uh, situation is so muddled, it's so confusing. One doesn't even know whether, you know, the normal rules of warfare apply over there. I mean, it clearly doesn't seem to be happening. So, you know, even if somebody has signed on to the Geneva Conventions, I mean, it's 
it's more about how all the rules of warfare are being violated in Syria. It's, uh, Syria is such a confused, muddled place right now uh, that, you know, it's kind of difficult for a normal person to figure out who's fighting whom. And, you know, you have Bashar al-Assad trying to cling on to power, you have Russia backing him, mm. uh, you have Iran backing him, but, you know, on the other hand, you have the U.S. backing other forces, and uh, then you have the Islamic State somewhere in the picture. Some chemical attacks in the past have been blamed on, uh, on the Islamic State. But again, you know, it's such a confusing uh, situation that, you know, it's clearly it's time for the world powers to come to grips with this situation. I mean, the UN is meeting, but then UN meeting and then talking about these issues is not going to solve things. You know, clearly there is a need to stop such attacks and, you know, stop situations like these. Uh, we have to, you know, if, if visuals like these don't affect people and don't get people motivated to stop the killing of children and women, right. then I don't know what's going to well, work. That's right. I mean, Geneva Convention, uh, 1993 Convention, they're all right in their place, but I mean, when you once you look at these heart-wrenching pictures and images, especially of the children breathing and you know gasping for air, it's 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 terrible to look at these yeah. images. Can we? Uh, and this is six years of warfare. Six. It's been going on since 2011. It's been yeah. six years. And in six years, we have constantly been seeing images like these, videos like these coming out, and it nowhere looks close to being resolved. Can you can you talk a little to us about how it all started? I think it started around Arab Spring. Can you yeah, I mean, you know, you had these. Uh, popular uprisings and you know uh, th there was a lot of expectation people had a lot of hopes that you know this is going to lead to real democracy but clearly that didn't happen and you know you in the arab world you have a lot of strong men like bashar al-assad people mm -hmm. who have for various reasons been backed by world powers you know either it's been the russian bloc it's or it's been the us led forces who have been backing these strong men mm. you've had it in egypt you've had it in syria mm. and now with the you know rise of islamic state you know people kind of look at that as you know a, they they they're resorting to politically expedient steps right. to kind of you know control the islamic state mm. but that doesn't you know take away from the fact that some of these people uh, some of these strong men in the arab states have really not cared about democracy and you know, if you really look at, uh, I mean, the, the 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 example, the glaring example is this uh, agreement between U.S. and Russia, where they had talked about destroying Syria's chemical weapon stocks, right. and the deadline was June 30th, 2014. Mm. Clearly, that deadline hasn't Crossed. been met. Mm. You know, and you know, even after that deadline, you've had attacks in 2015. You've had this, uh, this uh, attacks in 2016. Mm. Clearly, the situation in Syria is. You know, it's not normal. Right. Yeah. And do you think uh, the so-called power camps which have been set up with Russia on one side and US on the other, have they uh, contributed in making the situations worse than what it could have been by now? Clearly. I mean, yes, the, that that is one of the reasons. I mean, when you have two major powers like the US and Russia working at cross purposes, mm. uh, the situation is only going to get more complicated. You know, right. I mean, on one hand, Russia has been bent on, you know, propping up Assad. And on the other, you've had, uh, you know, the Americans working at a different uh, objective. So, you know, things will definitely get more complicated. And, you know, uh, I, I don't see things becoming untangled anytime in the near future. But I'm sure we have United Nations and United Nations Security Council. They have been talking about it. They have been holding meetings. They have been holding conventions about it. But where is the, when is the point when things will go beyond uh, policy meetings and conventions and actually you can see some change on the ground? Well, I mean, Syria is such a complicated issue right now. I don't think uh, a single meeting... I mean, there have been a number of uh, rounds of meetings, uh, you know, sponsored by the UN, talks sponsored by the UN, talks sponsored by other world powers to try and sort out this uh, tangle in Syria. Mm. But clearly things haven't moved. Mm. And uh, I, I personally don't think that the UN is going to be the forum where, you know, things are going to be sorted out quickly. Mm. The UN helps. Uh, you know, it can kind of set the ground rules. It can uh, establish a bottom line. But... Mm. You know, at the end of the day, uh, the UN itself is a very, I mean, it doesn't uh, contribute to very quick solutions. It's not going to be easy. Right. It's probably, you know, I mean, it has to be something that is more, you know, I mean, you if you don't have an agreement between the US and Russia, then, I mean, I, I, I don't see how things can move quickly in Syria. 
Right. But uh, Reza, if we, even, if we talk about Arab Spring again, considering that that was the point from where things started escalating further, starting with those 15 schoolboys who just made a graffiti on their school wall, premise wall, supporting the Arab Spring. That's how it started. And, and in the report say that one of the children, one of the all of them were arrested and one of them even died after brutal torture. And all the countries which were affected by the Arab Spring, be it Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, it's there is no semblance of stability still in a lot many of those countries. But what is it that specifically went wrong in Syria? Well, this thing that went wrong is, you know, I mean, look at these countries. These are all countries where you haven't really had any sort of democracy. Hmm. I mean, take Libya. For decades, it was ruled by somebody like uh, uh, Gaddafi. Gaddafi. Um, in Egypt, you had other strong men, you know, uh, Husni Mubarak. Hmm. No, I mean, the whole problem was people thought that people are just going to rise up and replace these strong men. But that doesn't really work, right? I mean, you can't, uh, that doesn't happen because hmm. these are countries where they haven't had democracy. Hmm. They haven't had any sort of, you know, there are even some people who think that it's probably better to have uh, strong men like Gaddafi or uh, Saddam Hussein. I mm. mean, look at the kind of uh, instability that has been there in mm. Libya and Iraq yeah. uh, after Gaddafi and uh, Saddam Hussein were removed. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, Saddam Hussein or Gaddafi were the solutions, mm. but just engineering something that removes leaders like these mm. and leaves a vacuum in its place mm. is not the solution. Right. You know. Clearly, people haven't thought things out. I mean, look at the U.S. response in Iraq. I mean, it's just been devastating. Mm. The uh, Obama pulled out the troops, and things have gone from bad to worse. And you know, you some of these countries, it's even worse. Like when you look at Iraq, or when you look at Syria, because of the sectarian uh, uh, divisions, mm. you know, uh, between Shias and Sunnis, it becomes even more complicated. Mm. So clearly, I mean, we don't have a you know a quick fix solution. We don't have a band aid that we can put on and you know kind of hope that things will get better. Mm. I think it's. Uh, my my fear is things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. Right. I know this is what is leading to the biggest refugee crisis in, the, in our living times right now. Yes. I mean, I read somewhere that half of Syria's refugees are children, and and that figure is roughly around 2.4 million. There are children who have been born as refugees. I mean, that doesn't only lead to a refugee crisis; that lead to an identity crisis also eventually. And you know, I mean, more than that, it uh, creates problems for uh, a lot of other countries. I mean, I was in Turkey last year, and you could see the Syrian refugees all over. They were on the streets, and they were sitting with these placards and saying, "I'm a Syrian refugee, help me." And these were families. I mean, out on the streets, men, women with children, and you know, I mean, clearly. This is spilling over into other countries, and then it affects these other countries, like Turkey. I mean, it's been a relatively more, you know, uh, stable country. Mm -hmm. But then, when you have a large number of refugees coming in, people see this, and then they get affected. And you know, this is the way groups like Islamic State can. The situation that, you know, is not just affecting Syria, but it's also affecting Syria's neighbors, it's affecting Europe. Mm. And if the world powers don't get their act together, mm. as I said, things are only going to get worse before they get better. We have been talking about conventions, we have been talking about agreements, but um, correct me if I'm wrong, aren't uh, uh, US and Russia the two countries which the, with the biggest stockpile of chemical agents? Well, I mean, but you know, but they, they, they've these are the countries that have already signed on, you know, mm. they have, they've already... But they're far from destroying yeah. the I mean, you know, pe people, the whole thing is that, you know, even India has started, uh, begun working and destroying its chemical weapons mm. stocks. Yeah. But, you know, the whole point is, you're not supposed to use these sort of weapons in conflict. Mm. You know, I mean, these images that we have of the children, if that doesn't, you know, I mean, move people, I don't know what else will. So, I mean, it's not a question of, I mean, clearly, you know, there are, Obama talked about red lines mm -hmm. of, you know, not using chemical weapons, and that red line has been crossed. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, when do we act after that? I mean, when, when, when do we move forward? When do we ensure that things like this don't happen? Right, right. And uh, the biggest problem with this is not only the visuals, but the number of casualties, and even if it doesn't, 
it causes a lot of casualties plus it leaves people i mean we have seen and you know if you talk about bhopal gas tragedy also i mean you know these kind of chemical agents they leave you handicapped for life they affect you for life they affect you for generations yeah i mean uh, bhopal is different i mean it was not a conflict it but yeah, conflict, yeah, yeah it but was an accidental the, the leak effect, the effect yeah is, but and it happened what in the 80s and yeah. we still have we people in bhopal suffering feel people from are the effects suffering. of uh, you know i mean uh, my wife has relatives who died in the uh, hmm. after the gopal gopal gas leak right and had repeated uh, attacks with gases or chemical agents so you're not just you know hurting one generation but several generations, several generations. Yeah. so the effect are, effects are going to be felt over several years yeah. right and uh, to people who are just joining us we're talking about uh, the recent attack in syria uh, the reports are unconfirmed right now we don't know the number of people who have died some reports updated reports say there are over 100 people who have died and as you can see from the visuals there's a uh, widespread destruction there's uh, the p- uh, people are severely affected hospitals are and we know that syria hospitals are not even properly staffed uh, we saw a video today of a doctor from a syrian hospital who said that 90% of our staff don't even have the proper gear to treat no agents i mean we don't know if it was sarin gas or whatever gas that has also not been con- confirmed yet but there you chemical war- warfare weapon and uh, it basically interferes uh, with the transmission of your nerve impulses so basically you lose control of all voluntary body activities and as you could could have seen in the videos and the pictures which have been circulating that uh, people start uh, frothing at the mouth people start breathing with pain they start choking and in the videos you can see that there are people there there's not even enough time to take those people to the hospital people are stripping off their clothes and you know dousing them with water to sort of bring them into a stable enough condition so they can be transported to the hospital so uh, as i was saying how many do you have a, a you know, rough idea how many times have these chemical agents been used oh, it's, it's again it's a complicated you know we have the bigger attacks that we know of there was one attack in 2013 which we talked about Domestics. where about yeah, 1500 people died hmm. uh, there was an uh, chlorine attack in 2014 according to reports there was a mustard gas attack in 2015 a mustard gas 2015 imagine i mean this was a gas that was used in the 1914 to 1918 war the great war world war 1 and that was when people said you know enough we can't be using these kind of weapons that's what in 1918 it's almost 100 years now yeah. and we are still talking about you know attacks with mustard gas and yeah. i mean you know i think it's the point where you know just simply talking about outrage is not enough yeah. i mean if this doesn't spur us to act if this doesn't spur the world powers to act I don't think anything will, you know, and I think Syrians are going to be stuck in this sort of, uh, you know, devastation, death, and you know, we're just going to have this cycle repeated endlessly. Mm. It's clear that you know, the world has got to take a position on the conflict in Syria. I mean, it it's been on what now six years, almost the civil war. It's caused tremendous devastation. It's caused tremendous upheaval. It's caused tremendous migration of refugees. Mm. it's you know allowed it's given space to a group like uh, the islamic state to grow and to you know take hold of territory so clearly i mean these are all interconnected issues mm. and if this doesn't make the world community act i don't know what else will mm. i just like to conclude with one last question um, can we rely or can the syrian population rely on just international law then there's russia camp and there's the us camp i mean i'm sure it, it it's a four way street right now and action has to be taken on the four way street but can we just rely on the international laws and conventions i think it's not even just a four way street it's much more than i mean if if you look at the kind of players that are involved you've got iran involved you've got uh, the syrians themselves you've got russia you've got us uh, you've got the european uh, union and you've got the un coming in and I mean the UN of course is not involved directly in the conflict over there but you know I mean the kind of players that are there mm. it's so confusing I don't think there's going to be a easy way out you know I mean it's not just going to be about conventions clearly I mean look at as we said repeatedly this agreement in 2014 to phase out all the uh, chemical weapons stocks in Syria that hasn't worked so you know clearly 
we need some sort of out of the box thinking, some new sort of solution to you know stop the kind of devastation we've been seeing. Thank you, Reza. Thank you for watching. You were uh, watching us live. We were discussing about the recent uh, chemical attack on Syria, on the northern Syria, which happened on Tuesday and which has left over 100 dead. And we are constantly getting updates on that and we'll be following this news. Please visit our website for more. Thank you.